This is a strange one. It's on a subject you'd think would be done and dusted, straightforward. A deal that should have been tied up months ago. And yet, here we are. Deep into January, the reigning seven-time Formula One world champion, Sir Lewis Hamilton, is a free agent. I openly dismissed all of the talks regarding his status as a driver a couple of weeks ago, but even I have to admit, this is getting weirder by the day, and by any measure, this isn't normal. City season in Formula 1 is a fluid, dynamic thing. We don't normally go deep on contract talks until after the summer break, but this year blew a lot of that perception away. Sebastian Vettel, Carlos Sainz Jr. and Daniel Ricciardo were all in talks with new teams while we were celebrating our last normal Christmas in 2019. F1 went full MotoGP in getting a lot of deals tied down early, two of the top tier seats already locked in with Verstappen and Leclerc tied down to long term deals. Eddie Jordan was another catalyst for discussion this morning when he claimed he'd let Hamilton walk if he was in charge. Yeah, I get it. He's a team boss, that's their mentality, he doesn't want to show weakness. You know, the same guy who was willing to give half his team away to sign Ayrton Senna. It's why he won so many Constructors titles, of course. Easy opportunities for roasting aside, the question everyone's been trying to dance around here, what's the hold up? Because let's be frank, half of you reading this are probably Hamilton fans. Man's mainstream now. The easiest perspective to have here is, he's Lewis Hamilton, they'll just get it done. The reality is, it might be a bit more complicated than that. First of all, the economics of the sport are different. Mercedes needs to be careful, there's a salary cap coming into 2023. A big element of that rule shift was because of Hamilton's alleged exorbitant salary in the first place. You can go above the $30 million designated for your drivers once that salary cap lands, but if you do, the excess comes out of your team's overall cap as tax. If you're Hamilton, you want to guarantee money for as long as you can, because any contract signed before 2023 has to be honoured. He's also 36 years old, and it's fair to assume that this might be his last major payday. If you're Mercedes, on the other hand, the less you can commit to, the better. It's why number two drivers like Valtteri and Mark Webber back in the day kept getting one-year deals. If you're the team, you want the leverage. Another example of this would be Sergio Perez joining Red Bull. Signing an additional one-year deal with them after their recent track record of drivers would normally be deemed as career suicide, especially after Racing Point used their release clause on him to clear the way for Sebastian Vettel. But it was either that, or be unemployed. That's the nature of professional sport and the power of the negotiation table. Perez didn't really have a leg to stand on here. Now, this isn't going to be the biggest endorsement of Lewis as a driver, but hear me out here. A lot of his success is in a relative vacuum. Mercedes has dominated pretty much all of this era without even a pretender to the throne. Really, the only yardsticks that Lewis has had to date have been Nico Rosberg, who went 1-3 and three against Lewis overall head-to-head -head and retired early at age 31, Sebastian Vettel, who we've finally fully come to appreciate as, as a driver overall but has had two late-season collapses and has been mediocre since, Valtteri Bottas, who has been beaten into oblivion every year since joining Mercedes, and Max Verstappen, who probably has the same issue Ricardo had, just a car that's nowhere near good enough to compete. And this was truly the year many of us viewers turned on the most recent Finnish porridge master. When you can't even drop your own signature catchphrase without getting carpet bombed on Twitter, times are rough. But no, that's not the real elephant in the room here. We gotta talk about the bar rhombus in Sakir. George Russell filled in on three days notice. He had to race in a cockpit designed for a man five inches shorter than him wore shoes a size too small, received bloody knuckles from all the times he banged his hands on the wheel and crushed his knees because they didn't fit properly. Despite all that, he was competitive right away, he missed pole by just two hundredths of a second, and had a debut win yanked out from underneath him. Twice! Amazingly, Russell not winning might have increased his stock even further than if he did. The adversity and determination of coming back from two unforced errors, as well as the visual metaphor of passing Bottas on track after losing his hard-earned gap, only made his performance look that much better. One of difficulty, as well as pure speed. 
When Toto Wolf after the race talked about Bottas in the context of, quote, we could only make a re-signing decision based on what we knew, it's the sort of quote that's going to make people think. It's the sort of quote that might make Daimler think. Now, if I'm being ultra critical on George Russell here, he's an incredibly hard talent to evaluate. He's had one race against the best of the best. Hamilton wasn't in said race. It was on a track we don't normally race around and probably won't again unless COVID persists. He drives for a team in the bottom three, significantly worse than the other seven. And his teammates to date have been Nicholas Latifi, who he already beat in Formula 2, and Robert Kubica, who was massively uncompetitive. Over a 23-race season, I'm still not fully convinced his baseline would be what we saw in Sakir. But it was good enough to plant a seed of doubt, and sometimes, that's all you need. If you're Mercedes with a rulebook that's designed to squeeze your resources not far away, if you could get maybe 90% of Hamilton's production for a fraction of the price, you might be tempted to pull the trigger from an economic standpoint. Karun Chanhok made that point during Sakir's weekend and was laughed out of the room, but I think it's a point that's held more weight the longer this goes on. With a Mercedes W12 in the future bound to still be the best on paper, would a team of Russell and Bottas win you the title? If half the hype Russell got after Sakir holds up, I wouldn't bet against it. Is the most guaranteed success maybe in Formula 1's history worth 40 to 50 million pounds a year? I hope it is. It sure as hell should be. Let's not forget, you're not just paying for Hamilton the driver, you're paying for Hamilton the brand. The man with big name connections like Tommy Hilfiger, now on the car in the race suits, and Police, the maker of those sunglasses you probably can't afford. A man whose star power only ascended further via his activism on and off the track. It's a powerful thing when you see Lewis on Good Morning America and Stephen Colbert. They're massive TV shows in a market that doesn't embrace motorsport as it once did, motorsport itself being relatively niche in the sporting landscape. The marketing power he brings to Mercedes, and Ineos who now own a third of the team, is far greater than whatever salary the average tweeter thinks is way too much to pay a guy. And that's where I'm at. Formula 1 is a sport of a thousand variables. It's exactly why we jumped up and down when Pierre Gasly and Sergio Perez won in the circumstances they did. And in this environment, Lewis Hamilton is the safest bet in the history of the sport. 73 wins and 6 titles in the 7 years since the hybrid era began. I'm pretty convinced that pushing him out of the door would be Honda's level of arrogance, similar to when they pushed Valentino Rossi out of the door in MotoGP. But on any level, the sport's greatest driver is a free agent halfway through January. The longer this goes on, the more people have every right to question just what's going on with Mercedes' difficult third chapter.